So, so I've, no, I've known Jensen and his family for a good few years now, uh, and Jensen actually faithfully serves some weeks at the back, doing the role that Graham's doing at the moment, which is brilliant. Uh, and we were chatting a few weeks ago, and I was just asking him, would you ever fancy having a go at doing at the talk on a Sunday morning? Uh, and uh, he said yes. Hey. Hey. So the way we're going to do it this morning, we're doing chapter 12, as you heard, and Jensen's going to start, do the first part, and I'm going to do the second part, is what we've agreed. But I have said, you know, it can be quite daunting standing here looking at a sea of faces. But I have told them that you're all very nice and that you're all and that you're all rooting for him. All right, so that's great. Okay, there you go. Good morning. Good morning. As much as I appreciate that reception, you have to give the same for Andy when he comes up. Otherwise, it's not fair. All right. <laughs> All right, that, that's the deal. That's the deal with me doing this. I'll just give a quick, quick sort of introduction of myself to people who don't know me. So, as Anne said, I'm Jensen. I've been coming here for some years, nine years, I think it is. So, since I was nine, hope that doesn't make any of you feel too old. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I help, I help with the, the projector at the back. And yeah, so I think we had this chat a couple of weeks ago, like you were saying. We won't, we won't talk about that specifically, just sort of came up in conversation and it's just sort of led on from there. Um, but yeah, this morning I'll be doing the first nine verses of Genesis chapter 12, and then Andy's going to hopefully pick up if everyone's still awake and, and carry on. Um, chapter 12 is, well, as Pauline introduced, this is about Abram, and Darren did brilliantly last week. Um, just, and it, it was mentioned, but it wasn't really gone into that much. So if it's all right, um, Graham, can we get the verse? Perfect. Oh, it's like clockwork, isn't it? <laughs> so I'll read. You'd have to stand up or read it out. You can just sort of follow along. Yeah. And we're just trusting my reading ability. So, The Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. A lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, I'm, I'm assuming that's like Sarai, but I, I'll just call her Sarah. His nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. <laughs> Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah. That one. At the. Thank you. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent. When Bethel on the west and. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, I was going to say that, but. Uh, on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the, the name of the Lord. So they're the first nine, nine verses. I'm going to sort of break this down. You can, thank you, Graham. I'm going to try and break this down as, as best I can into sort of three sections. So the first three, the middle sort of three, and then the end three. So that's just the way I've sort of done it. So in the first verse, God says to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you, which is is a big, a big sort of ask of, of Abraham to leave everything he knows, everything he's been comfortable with, everything, you know, that he's been, it says in, um, I think it's verse 5 or verse uh, 4, that he's 75 years old. So you can assume he's probably done a good stint there. So, so you know, where he's been for the last few years and, and just to sort of up and leave to the land I will show you. I, I will do that to the land I will show you. Just, <laughs> I'm just quoting it. But, um, and that, yeah, like I was saying, that's not, a, not an easy thing to do, you know. He doesn't know sort of like... So the food situation, the sort of water situation, you know, basic things, housing, it's going to be anywhere to, you know, park his camel, stuff like that. Um, and it, it would take a, an immense amount of trust in God, in God's word, to be able to say, yeah, you know what, I'm going to say, I'm not going to ask any questions, I hear what you're saying, I'm going to go and I'm going to do it. I'm going to leave everything I know, I'm going to take everything I know, and I'm going to move out, all right? I've been, um, I've been working at the, the Northern General for about six months now. And every single morning, I take the same route to work. Sometimes I start with my dad, sometimes I start with my mum's. It's not much difference. But I, I could tell you all the route, but I'm not going to, you know, I hope that you're all still awake by the end of it. But, um, but I take the exact same route every day. And I have to, I have to have Google Maps on. Because I, won't, I don't trust myself to go there without it. I know exactly where I'm going. I know exactly, you know, the sort of 
the road's only to take, and if, if it's a bit, gonna, you know, if I'm going to be late, I'll take this way. If I'm going to be early, I'll take this way. But every single time, I have to see where I'm going to be able to think, yeah, I, I'm confident I can get there. But, you know, I can't imagine someone saying to me, let alone go to a different site and work today, or, you know, go to work without seeing where you're going, because I need that sort of visual input. So for Abraham to be able to say, yeah, I'm going to listen to what God's saying, I'm going to go somewhere, I don't know where I'm going, he's going to show me on my route and not be able to, you know, see like a map or a final destination or anything like that. It takes a, a you know, a big amount of trust and, and you know, Landau will show you. It's not, it's not massively informative, is it? So, <laughs> you know, and, and leaving the country is, is one thing, but, you know, leaving to go to a, a random other country is another. Um, and, you know, over the first three verses, God is promising a lot to Abraham. He says, make you into a great nation and I will bless you. Make your name great and you will be a blessing. And, and uh, bless those who bless you. Curse those who curse you. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So, again, promise, uh, God is promising a lot if Abraham is ob- obedient to his instructions and trusts him. You know, I, I will bless those who bless you. So, you know, everyone he meets will be blessed through him. And I'll protect you by cursing those who curse you. And it's a big, a big promise, which only can come from God. That can't come from any humanly source. You know, and trusting in God's word will give you these, these things that no human can provide. So just a quick recap for the first three. God has told Abram to go somewhere that he will show him, and in return has promised to bless and protect him. Is it all right if we could just get uh, four and five up, Graham, please? So I'm just going to reread them just to familiarize myself. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife, yeah, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. So, fortunately, Abram makes the right decision by trusting God's words, and, and he, he sets out, you know, Abram went as the Lord had told him. He took his wife and his nephew with him. And that sort of comes back in with the, you know, being able to trust God and being obedient of God's instructions, which are two very linked, linked things in this sort of passage of verses. Because if he, he can, it's all good trusting God and saying, yeah, I trust your word and I, I know that you'll bless and protect me. But if he doesn't act on those and be obedient on those instructions, well, he's, well first of all, he's not going to leave, so he's not going to get to the land I will show you. He won't get to see whatever wonderful place that might be. But, you know, he's, he's also not going to be blessed because as much as he's trusting in God, he's not doing what God's asking him to do. And, you know, this sort of, sort of being obedient and trusting in God's word can be found in, you know, multiple parts of the Bible. I think the main one that stuck out to me was Noah and Noah's Ark, because God has said, look, you need to build a boat. I did a bit of research as well, actually. So, the, uh, apparently, Noah's Ark was 450 feet long, and a Boeing 747 is about 270 feet the Titanic was 800 feet, so, you know, it's a good, a good size, and, you know, you don't have, like, a crane or anything like that, so, you know, it, t- it would have taken him a long time, it's not a five-minute five job. So, God asking him to do this is, is a big thing, so, you know, Abraham to leave his country, leave everything he knows, leave everything he's comfortable with, and Noah to build a, a big ark and get two of every animal and, and take his family and, and survive a flood. Um, it, it's, a, it's a big ask, and these decisions... You know, everyone will have decisions in their own life where you're trusting in God's word. And I think it, it's important to seek out and, and seek his, his direction and be able to trust in his word and be obedient of whatever he tells you. So I've currently got a, a decision to make myself regarding sort of what I'm doing in my future. Um, I currently work, like I've been saying, but got a place for university in September to do physiotherapy, which is where I'm working now. And I've got a decision to make. Do I carry on working where I'm working? And, you know, there's some other things that I won't go into that affect my decision or go to university. And, and praying and seeking out God's instruction on this is, is sort of the t- route I'm taking. It's the right, I'm assuming that's the, the right route. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so praying and seeking out God's instruction. But then there's always the, the possibility that God will say to me, look, this is a really good option, this is a really good option, but I want you to do this. And that, if God tells you to do that thing, I'm going to have to trust him. Because so I don't know what that might lead me into, and I don't know where that might take me. But trusting in God's word and being obedient to the instructions will take me on the best path I can get. Yeah. 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 And then, but yeah, just going back, so, so Noah being obedient of God's word saved him, saved his family. Abram being obedient of God's word 
is going to deliver him safely to where God wants him to get, uh, want, where God wants him to get to. So yeah, so Abram has agreed in, and he's gathered everything he owns and all his people, and being obedient to God's instruction. As if anyone noticed, um, in verse five, God makes a, uh, Abram makes a very, very quick one verse journey. He sets off from Haran and arrives in, in the same sentence. <laughs> so I, I don't know if he's, if he's kind of like Weetabix for breakfast or. Is it right if we get verses uh, six and seven up, please? <laughs> yeah, there we go. Abram travelled through the, the land as far as the site of the great tree of Glory. at the <laughs> at that time the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. So you know, in, in these verses it says, to your offspring I will give this, give this land, but at the time it wasn't, wasn't theirs to own. It was, it, the Canaanites owned the land. And there isn't any sort of mention of how this, this changeover in ownership of the land happens, so I'm going to sort of push that to one side and we'll ignore that, but it, it's, it's again trusting in God and, yeah. and he's promising this to him. It's not saying, look, if you go there, I'll do you there safely, but it's sort of your own, you need to sort everything out yourself. It's I'll, look, this is what I want you to do. I'm going to take you there. You're going to get there safely. You'll be a blessing to people. And when you get there, it'll be yours to own, for your offspring's to own. And that sort of thing is it's not being able to say, look, you're going to get delivered here, and it'll be yours. Don't worry about it. It's very, very easy to ask. For Abraham, it would have been easy to ask, how? How's that going to happen? Why, like, why, why is this happening? But he doesn't, as, well, as far as it's documented. And it's... It's a term that, um, that Andy used when I was talking to him the other day. And it's, trust is the bedrock of our faith. So being able to trust in God and trust that he's going to say, look, this is what's going to happen, and then he's going to do it and follow through on it. And, you know, the questionless faith and questionless trust. So not asking questions and not sort of saying, right, I know this is what you tell me to do, but I don't understand how you're going to do it. How are you going to, how's this going to happen? How's this going to happen? Why is this happening? That sort of, that sort of thing is... is Obviously, not Abraham doesn't do that. He just sort of trusts God and thinks, right, this is what's happening. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to do it. And he just, and it, well, as follows, obviously. But as I think, especially for me, for example, if someone asks me to do something that might seem sort of outlandish or strange, I will, I will want to know why, and I will want to know how are you going to, how am I going to do that? And I think it would be the same with anyone in the room. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to point fingers or anything, but I'm sure in everyone's own life, they've thought, right, God's telling me to do this. How is this going to happen? How am I going to be able to pull this off? How is it going to work? But, and it's not something that's, that's easy, and it's not something you can do sort of first time around. You know, if God says, right, I want you to move country, and I want you to help these people out here, or I want you to go on this mission and help these people out, it's, it's not something that you can say, right, okay, I'll just do it. You know, it would be, especially if it's that first time you've been asked to do it, you would want to ask how, and you'd want to know why, wouldn't you? So, I think, yeah, that, that sort of questionless faith is something that I know I'm working on, I'm sure people here today are also working on it themselves, so. Um, but yeah, and then it, it sort of, it, it, it carries on, um, uh, verse 7, 8, and 9, to, uh, if we could get them up, Graham, please. I'm keeping you busy there, aren't I? Sorry about that. <laughs> the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on towards the hills east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So it's, for the rest of this sort of end of mind and verses, is, is, he's, he's built an altar where he can worship the Lord and where he can remember this encounter with God and remember what he's promised to him. And sort of just not let that sort of God's instructions slide, if that makes any sense. So not letting what God's told him go under the radar. Like, it's not his decision. He's not chosen to do this. He's been told to do it, and he's done it, and now look where he is. And he's got to honour that by building an altar and praising God for it. Yeah, um, yeah so, uh, and he, he continues on his journey, and he eventually gets there, building altars uh, uh, on arrival. So, if you're going to take anything sort of away from, from this short sort of, I don't know how long it's been, <laughs> amount of time I've been speaking for, it would be two things, three things. One is trusting in God's word. 
to his, the obedience of his instructions, however strange or peculiar or sort of outlandish it might seem. And three, I'm, I'm not great at public speaking, but I feel like I've done a good job. <laughs> I hope Andy gets this reception as well. I'll, I'll be watching you as I'm sort of going outside to try and stop shaking and sweating nervously. But, um, <laughs> but thank you, thank you. Great job, Jensen. Brilliant. So, so uh, uh, I've got what, 10 minutes? So, so this, this passage, uh, this story of Abraham in this chapter is just a tiny, tiny mirror of what it's like to become a Christian and a tiny reflection of what it is to follow Jesus today. So, so we have at the beginning that God chooses Abraham. Right? And for you and I as we're Christians, as we're following Jesus today, we might use the language that I've chosen Jesus or I've chosen to be a Christian, but the reality is behind that is that God has chosen you. Right? It's great news. So this story immediately speaks to us today. Uh, and the second thing that we see is that God then gives Abraham a plan and a purpose and sets him off, as Jensen's told us, on this journey, not knowing where he's going. Um, or as, as we heard from Pauline early, earlier, get thee out of thy country. Uh, and he sets him off on a purpose. And the same is true for you and me as we follow Jesus, that he gives us a plan and a purpose. We haven't chosen, and that's the problem, with if we say we've chosen to follow Jesus, it kind of feels like it's for our benefit. But actually God has chosen you and has chosen you and given a purpose to you and to your life for you to take hold of. And then the next thing that Jensen's reminded us of is that God has promised, sent promises over Abraham. He promises to bless him. He promises about how numerous his children are going to be. He promises about his offspring occupying the land. And the same, you know what, is true for you and I, that God has spoken promises over your life that he will fulfill, that are true through the death and resurrection of Jesus and what was achieved on that cross. And God will always set out and fulfill his promises and not let them go. And so that, that's our first bit of the chapter. And then we get to the second bit of the chapter and it's just the same. It's just like following Jesus and being a Christian because we discover that Abraham makes a few mistakes, <laughs> makes a few bad decisions, <laughs> does something not quite right. And you know what? As Christians, we make a few mistakes. And we do some things that are, well, not quite right. Uh, and we have to ask the question, what's going on? So three things. I'm just going to read the second half of the chapter. Uh, if you don't have to put the words up, Graham, but I'm going to read them. If you want to follow them, please do. Now there was a famine in the land, and Abraham went down to Egypt to live there for a while because the famine was severe. As he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarah, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but will let you live. Say you are my sister, so that I will be treated well for, for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. When Abraham came to Egypt, the Egyptians saw that she was a very beautiful woman, and when Pharaoh's officials saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and she was taken into his palace. He treated Abraham well for her sake, and Abraham acquired sheep and cattle, male and female donkeys, men servants and maid servants, and camels. But the Lord inflicted serious diseases on Pharaoh and his household because of Abraham's wife Sarah. So Pharaoh summoned Abraham, "'What have you done to me?' he said." Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say uh, she is my sister so that I took her to be my wife? Now then, here is your wife. Poor woman. Take her and go. Then Pharaoh gave orders about Abraham to his men and they sent him on his way with his wife and everything he had. Three things, hopefully quickly, for this, for, uh, that I pulled out of this. The first thing is God, as, we, as Jensen told us, God, Abraham arrived at the land God had promised. He arrived at Canaan. And you think, great, I'm in the will of God. I've got the place that God's got in store for me. But what happens? Famine, that's right, a famine. Uh, there's a famine that God says, I have a plan, I have a purpose for you, this is it. But then famine, there's hardship, 
There's difficulty. And how many times do we equate being in the will of God with things going well, with things making sense, with things adding up, with life being smooth and okay, with relationships going well, with the church going woohoo and all that kind of stuff. Uh, And how many times do we think we're out of the will of God if things are difficult uh, and we're out of sorts with people and things are bad things are happening to us? Uh, uh, And we confuse that. And it's a seduction of modern Christianity that we think things should be going well and it isn't true and I'm confident of that because Jesus said in this world you will have but take heart I have overcome the world so it's wrong of us when we think if things are going badly you know and the type of language we use I'll be blunt and I'll probably upset a few people is things like oh I'm under attack Right? And we use that sort of language. And it kind of shifts what's really going on. Because the question we've got to ask all the time here, is God still at work? Is God still at work in Abraham's life while all this is going on? And we'll come back to that in a minute. You see, it, it, couldn't have, it must have been hard for him. He's thinking he's walking into God's plan. He's doing this amazing thing of faith and trust, as Jensen's reminded us. And yet he lands in this place of famine. But how often does the challenge come at the start of what God has called you to do? How often when God speaks and says promises into your life um, and wakes you up to see what he's got in store and you think, yeah, I'm going to make a step of faith here. How many times at the start of that do difficulties come? Just like for Abraham here. So often, right? Look at Noah building the ark and they all mock him and deride him. Look at Nehemiah trying to rebuild the city and the, and the uh, opposition that he has to do that. Look at Jesus at the start of his ministry, led by the Spirit into the wilderness and tempted. Look at the early church as God moves so powerfully persecution breaks out against them. Time and again scriptures teach us and church history teaches us that when God moves in power and his people respond in faith that there is difficulty and hardship and conflict at that point in time. And the challenge we have is what are we going to do about that? 146 I don't know if you meant to say this earlier. I thought you did. Right, okay. <laughs> so, right. so, so we're, for 146, you know, we're in faith for what God has promised there, for what's going on. And we, we mentioned at the family night the other week about the, the, the applications we've put in for grant funding. And we talked about one we're going to the government that would cover the rest of the balance as, as we have it at the moment. And then we heard this week that we didn't get it. Uh, and we didn't get any of it, any, any of that money. So we have to look elsewhere. But, and we could think, oh, no, is God really in this? Is this really what he wants to do? No. No, God, we, we, we fall back yeah. just like Abraham on the promises of God. We fall back just like Pauline on the promises of God because he will fulfill what his word sets out over your life, over my life, over this church, over his church in this nation, over this community because it is born in the fact that he has chosen us and he has spoken promises over us. Second thing uh, out of this passage, we read that... Uh, he has to move to Egypt. He goes down to Egypt. He arrives at the place God has called him to. What next? He has to leave. Now, I don't know how the story goes, because as Jensen said, we don't get a lot of detail. But I can kind of imagine that as he moved his family and his servants and his animals and flocks from uh, from Haran all the way down to Canaan, they kind of had a sense, well, we're doing this because we're following God's word. And God has spoken to us and we're stirred up by it. And they kind of get to Canaan and you can see them going back to Abraham and saying, uh, this is, uh, so this is where God wants us, right? Uh, uh, there's no food. We're going to die. And so Abraham has to get them all up again, round them all up again, say, right, we're going down to Egypt. Well, that's not where God wants us to go. He wants us here. Uh, And so uh, there's this challenge in this passage that he's reached the place God wants him to be. But actually, just to survive, he needs to go somewhere else for the time being. And this is, to, to me as I read this, I think this is a great lesson in that most spiritual gift of common sense. Right? Sorry, you won't find it in 1 Corinthians or Romans 8 or... 
although it is, it is that, yeah, it is, or it is the gift of wisdom, but it is the gift of common sense. And what I mean by that is we have a tend- Why didn't Abraham stay in Canaan and say, right, I'm in the place God has asked me to be. God will deliver me. God will deliver us. There's a famine here, but God will provide. And we have a great tendency and a danger to over-spiritualize things at times. That means we're trying to look for things, and God is saying, I just want you to exercise common sense. Right? Go where there is food, Abraham. And, and so he, he leaves. Um, you know, and, and it just strikes me that sometimes it's okay to respond to what's going on around and seemingly move away from the place God has called us to. That's what this teaches us. And why is that again? Because behind the scenes, it's God who has chosen Abraham. And God who has called Abraham. And God who has spoken promises over Abraham that he will fulfill. And the same is true for you and I. And we can move ourselves through common sense or other reasons to a different place that we don't really want to be. And I really don't want to be up here as a worship singer, believe me. right? But God will move powerfully because at the end of the day, your life and my life are actually lived out in a context that God has chosen you. And God has spoken promises over you. And it's not about what we're doing so much. It's about us learning what it is to trust God. And Abraham, as we know, is a man who is taught uh, through Scripture that he's a hero of the faith. That he's held up as the guy who's the father of the faith. That faith and trust are the things that, 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 that we remember him for. And yet he's got to learn that. And that is what's going on through this point, uh, at this point in time. Sometimes it's not the message we want to hear, but sometimes we need to move, God moves us to a place, or we need to move to a place just out of common sense. Remember COVID lockdown. Who wanted to be in that place? Right? But there's an element, and you might disagree with me, there's an element of common sense uh, about that. And just as I was thinking about it, um, so I had credit to my wife here who. Who suggested strongly that I started keeping a list of things I could use as, as analogies in sermons? And I was just looking through this one, and uh, uh, I don't know, Terry, Terry Bamford, if you're in 146, but there were, I've got jotted down here in my notes on the 24th of May 2020, Angie and I visited Terry. Uh, so this is what, two months into lockdown, uh, and he stood on his doorway, and we stood six feet back, and we chatted about the, the message that had been out that morning uh, online. Uh, And I wrote down, visited Terry during lockdown. He'd listened to the service on the radio about the resurrection. The disciples had been fishing all night and not caught anything after the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus told them to cast the net on the other side. And Terry said, and the message was, why should they do that? They know what to do. They've been doing it all night. Now God asked them to take a step of faith and try something different that they wouldn't have done anyway, because that's not how they do it. And Terry, bless him, he compared that, he's telling us, compared that to being in lockdown. God has got us doing things that we never would have done because they were not part of our routine, not how we do things. And yet we've done it and God has blessed us. You know, bless you, Terry, for spotting something when we're in a place where we don't want to be and actually God is teaching us stuff. And the irony now is that Terry, I hope, is in 146 and the guys are in 146 with the benefit of stuff we learned to do in lockdown and stream stuff uh, out there. That's great. So the third thing I just want to bring out is, uh, in this story is there's this strange story about what he does with his wife, Sarah. You know, there's this cultural pressure being applied to Abraham as he ends up in Egypt. And how does he respond? You know, we've gone from a story of a man who is exercising faith and trusting God on this journey to a man who abdicates his own responsibility, makes his wife extremely vulnerable when he's supposed to protect her, and do all of that just to save his own skin. It's the same guy that is exercising faith and trust in following God to Canaan. How, how do you this? Well, first off, I'd say this is a great story of how God works with broken, mixed up people. Hallelujah. Because <laughs> we all do that, right? We all make mistakes. We all do things wrong. And God works in us. But the pressure of the culture and the circumstances conspired to make him act out of self-preservation rather than faith. 
And it's the same today when you and I, when we drift from the place of blessing, when we drift from the place that God has brought us to, when we lose that passion that we once had, and that singleness of vision when we first responded to him, then we become vulnerable to the pressures of society around us, of the circumstances we find ourselves, of the culture in which we live. And when that happens, we lower the bar. And we trust ourselves rather than trusting God. And we trust our gifts and abilities rather than trusting his promises. And we want to save our own skin rather than lean into the fact God has chosen us and called us by name. Everything about the gospel screams the opposite. Jesus resisted, not only resisted, but spoke out against the prevailing culture of his day, as did Paul and Peter and the other apostles as we go through the rest of the New Testament, as does the early church, as the church history, when you read through church history and see when the church is on fire for Jesus uh, and God is moving powerfully, they're speaking out against the ills of society of that day. So ask the question, how does the cultural pressure that we have today turn our eyes from the call of God on us to be more bothered about saving our own skin. You know, we haven't got time to go into that. I'll leave that for you to think about. Maybe that's a good bit of homework. But think, you know, how does, how does our succumbing to the advertising industry reduce us down to being more bothered about our own skin than actually following the call of God? How does the, 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 the proliferation of the entertainment industry and something that is so temporary and so uh, transient become something that's so important in, in the world today? How do we respond to that? How do we respond to the sexualization of everything and anything that is out there right now? How do we respond? Respond to the proliferation of technology that means I can do anything, good or bad, very easily. Thank you very much. On a device in my hand. How do we respond to that? How do we how do we resist the culture around us trying to squeeze it into its mould? Uh, uh, and encouraging us to become men and women who simply want to be quiet and not raise our head, but actually become men and women who hold on to his promises. How do we challenge the the issues of sexuality, of gender confusion, confusion, of racism, of abortion, of the rich and poor divide, of the confused mishmash of values in society, all of which are complex, right? I'm not simplifying that at all. But there's a tendency as Christians in this day and age to let that us squeeze us down and push us down. Uh, And like Abraham responding to the culture of his time, being more bothered about saving his own skin, rather than leaning back into and trusting the promises of God. He'd been called by God to a massive purpose, to be the father of nations, his faith in God to be a shining example, and in his following of God to reflect something of the Jesus that was to come. And we too, you and I, this morning, here in 146, watching online, we've been called We've been chosen by the same God that chose Abraham. We've been called and chosen by name. And we are being built into his church right now to be a light for the nations. To speak and live out the resurrection of Jesus. To pray his kingdom in. To pray the not yet kingdom into the here and now. So that we see him move and transform people's lives. What a calling that we have. It's massive. So let's stand together against the pressures around us and encourage one another. And let us learn to put others, not ourselves, first and pursue the glory of Jesus in this life with our strength and resolve together. Leaning into that very fact we had at the beginning, that it is God who has called us. And it is God who has given us a plan and a purpose. And it is God who has spoken promises over your life and our life. And so we can give ourselves to trust him. As Paul writes, uh, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I'll just finish with, uh, for some strange reason, I've had a really old hymn from when I was a kid going around my head. Follow him, follow him. Yield your life to him. He has conquered death. He is king of kings. Accept the joy which he gives to those who yield their lives to him. Amen. Amen.